Look sharp, feel sharp, be sharp. Use Gillette Blue Blades with the sharpest edges ever honed. Gillette's cavalcade of sports is on the air. Good afternoon, baseball fans everywhere. This is Red Barber with Mel Allen at Yankee Stadium in New York, greeting you for the Gillette Safety Razor Company as the Brooklyn Dodgers and New York Yankees get set for the opening game of the 1949 World Series. Well, of course, Mel, we all remember you from those golden days with the Yankees. Now, how many years did you actually do the Yankee broadcast? What year to what year? Well, I would say approximately 23 years, 39 through 43, and I went in the service at the end of the 43 season, and then came out in 46 and stayed with them through 64. The reason a lot of people would jump on me, trying to be as candid as I can, didn't. As will often happen, those who do criticize you, whether it be someone in a letter or somebody writing a column for a newspaper or somebody on the air, any critic, will be magnified because you were with a dynasty. Because from 46 through 64, the Yankees only lost the pennant in 46, in 48, in 54, and in 59. <laughs> so in those 19 years, they only lost the pennant four times, so they won 15 times. <laughs> and there was a stretch in there where they won five consecutive pennants and five consecutive world titles. Then they had another stretch where they won four pennants in a row. Then they had a second stretch in that series where they won five pennants in a row again, although they didn't win. They won something like three out of the five world titles. So that was a tremendous dynasty, and it just sort of kept building up, and even people sitting on the fence got tired of one team winning, you know, that type of thing. Or those who were against the Yankees got further against them. But instead of getting angry at the guys who did it, they got mad at me because I was broadcasting. I was the nearest person they could get to as far as the team is concerned. I had nothing to do with them uh, winning. I didn't get one walk or one base hit or score one run or anything else. Somebody got a little more excited, but I had nothing to do with them winning or losing for that. Concerned. The Yankees won in a tremendous finish in the American League. The Dodgers won in a tremendous finish and one inning, you might say, in the National League. So in 1939, the just heard Mel Allen became the New York Yankees radio announcer. He was born in Birmingham, Alabama on February 14, 1913. While attending the University of Alabama, he became the public address announcer for the Crimson Tide football team. In 1933, when radio station WBRC asked Alabama coach Frank Thomas to recommend a new play-by-play -play announcer, he suggested Allen. Allen graduated from the University of Alabama School of Law in 1937. Shortly after, he took a train to New York City for a week's vacation. While there, he auditioned for a staff announcer's job at CBS. CBS's top sportscaster, Ted Husing, had heard many Crimson Tide broadcasts. Allen was hired for $45 per week. When I first joined CBS, actually, working the early morning shift, I opened up the network 6 o'clock in the morning, but believe it or not, I never even knew how to make a station break when I got <laughs> to the network, because all I did was do football games in college. The other fellows made the station breaks, and I didn't know anything at all about radio. And later on, they switched us over. Bert and I primarily handled the dance band shows, which was your 11 to 1 prime time, let us say. That's right. Instead of like the Tonight Show, you did dance bands in New York. Sometimes you'd, they would switch out to Chicago or San Francisco or Los Angeles, but primarily most of your great bands were playing in and around New York City. We used to get a kick out of alternating doing Benny Goodman and Tommy Dorsey, Glenn Miller. Although he was calling baseball, Allen continued to announce other shows on the network. He was CBS announcer for the Duffy's Tavern Pilot, which aired on Forecast, July 30, 1940. Hello, Duffy's Tavern, where the elite meet to eat, special today, pigs pickle feet. Archie's speaking, Duffy ain't here. Oh, hello, Duffy. Yeah. Oh, yeah, must be three or four customers here already. You hear that, Duffy? You're in business again. Uh, listen, Duffy, you picked out a very bad time to call up. Yeah, we're just gonna go on the air for a broadcast. Now, wait a minute, Duffy. Don't get all excited. It ain't costing a cent. No, the network's doing it for prestige. Well, now, 
Now, Duffy, I can't brandy words with you now. We're just going on the air, I'm telling you. Goodbye, Duffy. I- I'll see you later. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Mel Allen. Forecast invites you to join us for a decidedly informal evening at Duffy's Tavern, where anyone under the sun is likely to drop in any time to talk things over with Archie. Almost anyone may drop in tonight. Now, people we're sure will be around, however, are Gertrude Neeson, Colonel Stupnagel, Larry Adler, and John Kirby's orchestra. And now I turn you over to that past master of ceremonies, Archie. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is the voice of Duffy's Tavern speaking, uh, formerly Duffy's Bar and Grill, and still owned by the same proprietorship. And we take great pride in presenting them great musicians, John Kirby and his high schoolians. They offer their own version of Royal Garden Blues. Uh, you will note that in the second chorus, the piccolo player hits a note so high that it can only be heard by a dog. Uh, Mr. Kirby. <laughs> Duffy's Tavern, where the elite meet to eat the special today, Pig's Pickle Feet. Oh, hello, boss. Hey, how'd you like Kirby's band? They what? Duffy, they do not. <laughs> well, I see what you mean. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. What is it, Archie? It's uh, Duffy, Mr. Kirby. He says he thinks your band is great. All right, Duffy, I know. <laughs> I can't tell a guy that, though. You don't understand artists, Duffy. You know, they're much more insensible than you and me. <laughs> you gotta tolerate them. Ah, but Duffy, you haven't liked nothing since Chauncey all got cracked up on Mother McCree. <laughs> You're living in a graveyard full of Irish tennis. Wait a minute, Duffy. Uh, <clears throat> Great rotation, uh, uh, no floor shell just walked in. <laughs> what? Uh, all right, I'll tell her. I'll speak to you later. Uh, good evening, Miss Neeson. Hi, Archie. Uh, say, Miss Neeson, I hate to, uh, you know, I hate to bury sleeping dogs, but Duffy has been complaining about you. Oh, uh, what's old Novocaine brain squawking about now? Well, he claims you insulted his best customer, Mr. Feldever K. Beldorf. Was you out to dinner with Beldorf last night? Yes, and I'll never go out with that crumb again. Huh? You know what happened? He asked me to go out to dinner last night, so I go with him. Well, you know how I never like a strange man to pay for my meal. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so I said to him, Mr. Beldorf, I insist that this dinner should be Dutch. But he said he absolutely wouldn't hear of it. Well, that's nice. He said I had to pay for him, too. <laughs> that's that Beldorf. So what did you do? Oh, I did what any lady would do. I broke a plate over his head. <laughs> There's a saying old says that love is blind 
CBS had an exclusive on the Poughkeepsie Regatta, and NBC, you know, competitive as they are, all networks are, all stations are, they sent Graham McNamee up in an airplane to swipe it from the air on the theory that CBS only had an exclusive on the ground rights and not the air rights. Mm -hmm. Following the week, CBS had an exclusive on the Drake Relays out in Des Moines, Iowa, or NBC did, and just to get even, CBS assigned Ted to go out there and climb up on a telephone pole and with field glasses, cop the Drake Relays from NBC that way. It happened that Long Island was just full of sports activities that day. The prime event was the Vanderbilt Cup races. So they decided to send me up in an airplane, and I had never flown before, number one. I just scared to death. In fact, I went up for the trial run for the short wave technicians trying out their short wave from being up in the air and down below. And NBC had it exclusively down below. So just to uh, make it appear that we weren't trying to swipe it from them, there was a state tennis match going on out there. There were sailboat races going on out in the sound and things like that. So we went up in the plane, went on the air. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I remember somewhat the opening line. Uh, this is Mel Allen speaking to you on behalf of the Columbia Network. Circling uh, in the Eastern Airlines plane, which they donated for the plug, and now they got a second one <laughs> years later. Long Island is the mecca of the sports world today, and I was talking about all these other events except the automobile race, but this is what we finally got to. We timed it. We knew what time they were supposed to take off. Now, the only script I had, because this came up at the last moment, I cut out of the New York Times the lineup of the automobiles, just as you'll have in the 500 mile race. Three cars to a line, 11 lines deep, 11 rows deep, 33 cars. I had done other uh, homework during the week when I found out about it, but the only actual script I had was just simply the lineup of cars. But I had done a lot of reading about it and I knew that there were certain hairpin turns in the race, very uh, dangerous and in the event of rain, that they were going to postpone it from the Saturday, it was scheduled to the following Monday. The McNamee is on the ground. Now I'm up in the air. And I was really up in the air because at the scheduled time, none of those cars moved. I can see what and you mean. And we, we keep circling and circling. And I was talking about everything that I had remembered, you know, from doing your homework. And finally the producer slipped me a note, said, I guess we better go down. Something must be wrong. But he knew as well as I did that if it were raining, they were going to call it off. And it did look like it was raining. We were being upstairs. It was dark. And you see some little rain against the windows. So we went down, and sure enough, they'd called the race off. But we had no way of knowing it. Well, it turned out I had been on the air ad-libbing some 52 minutes. And some vice president at CBS was listening and wanted to know who that was doing that. And that's how you get a break. So that's I can right. say you have to be at the right place at the right time. <laughs> well, I guess you But were. you have to be a little bit prepared, too. I'll have to add that for the benefit of the folks who want to get into this business. After Ruth and Garrick retired, Joe DiMaggio became the next Yankee legend. The Yankees' main rival, the Boston Red Sox, were led by fellow future Hall of Famer Ted Williams. Norman Corwin riffed on this rivalry during his production of Between Americans, for Screen Guild Theater, which aired the night of December 7th, 1941. Or else it might be an argument between two baseball fans as to which is the better team, the Yankees or the Red Sox. Yeah, but look! The Yanks are a bunch of old men and cripples. Yeah, yeah. They won't last, I tell you, they yeah. won't last! Well, it gets good and hot around the middle of July. Yeah. Well, the double headers begin piling up. What are you talking? Listen, the man's just having the best season he ever had. Ah. He's an old man, huh? Keller hitting a dozen homers. Ah. I'd like to be a cripple like that. New home run record for the club. Won't last, huh? Who's the Red Sox got as good as the Mayors? Name one guy. Name one. Oh, name two. Ted Williams. Well, a good hitter. No getting away from that. What you say? Better than the man? Wait a minute. Do you say? I had an interview with Joe McCarthy the other day. It was his 88th birthday. Of course, he managed the Yankees and the Red Sox after the Cubs. 
but having managed the Yankees and Red Sox, I had to ask him a question, and frankly, knowing Joe real well, I knew he wasn't going to answer it. But I also knew that the fans would want that question asked. So I asked Joe, I said, Joe, you manage both the Yankees and the Red Sox. Most folks would like to know, in your opinion, who is the greatest, Joe DiMaggio or Ted Williams? And I knew what his answer was going to be. He said, they're both great. <laughs> you know, and, but yet I knew what his actual thoughts were. And it was proven by a poll taken on all the media and with the fans voting coast to coast about three, four years ago. The question was, who is the greatest living ball player, active or inactive? And the winner was Joe DiMaggio. Now, I've been with Ted Williams many times, and, and Ted will tell you, Jiminy Crickets, I'm not in his league, is a total ball player. DiMaggio will tell you there's no greater classic hitter that I've ever seen than Ted Williams. And it wasn't a mutual admiration society. They were giving you the honest answers. They meant it. However, that didn't mean that Joe wasn't a great hitter. Ted could hit well in the clutch, but he had an element of stubbornness to which he would agree. When they put that overshift on him, he knew he was a great hitter, and he just wanted to show him he could beat it. You just couldn't. When you put everybody over on one side and left field is wide open, there's no third baseman, all you got to do is bunt the ball down there and you walk to first base, you got a base hit. <laughs> and he could have done that because he could control the bat, being yeah. the greatest hitter. He's the last hitter ever to hit over 400 in the major leagues. I'm taking nothing away from Ted. I just mean he was just on a 3-2 pitch, eighth inning, ninth inning, winning run on second base. If the pitch was three inches outside or four inches, Ted would take it, take a walk. His theory being, if they start making you bite at pitches a little bit outside the plate, the next time it's going to be a little further and a little further until the first thing you know is making you bite at pitches a foot outside the plate or something like that. DiMaggio's philosophy was, in the same situation, the count of three and two, if the pitch was a little outside the plate, as long as I could see the ball, meaning as long as, as it wasn't, he could uh, see it well enough to realize he could get the bat on the ball, he's swinging. Because he said, I'm not being paid fourth to walk. By the same token, Joe didn't always get a hit by swinging at those kind of pitches. That's right. Both players missed three seasons in the mid-1940s while at war. Ted Williams missed most of two more during the Korean conflict. <laughs> 